Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 73, a message which I am entitling Life on the Edge, reading from Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace, the garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore his people return to this place and waters of abundance are drunk by them. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long. I chastened and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream, when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish, but you have, de you have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. We come once again into the song book, the psalm book, of the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, of more than 3,000 years ago, and it was the hymnal of the early church, the earliest believers. They knew these psalms, and they used them, and I'm sure that Jesus also, he knew these. It is no surprise that through the New Testament, the Psalms are quoted more often than any other single book of the Old Testament. And today, how we love the Psalms and how that they have become a part of us in a very powerful way. This is the first of the Psalms of Asaph that we come to. We have considered several of the Psalms of David and we have also considered one of the Psalms which come from the sons of Korah, 
But here, this is one of the 12 psalms which we have recorded that it comes from Asaph. Who was Asaph? We're not exactly sure, but we're glad that he took pen in hand and that very frankly wrote down what was in his heart that we might use it for instruction, for edification, and that we might consider how that our hearts are not so very different from hearts well over 2,000 and 2,500 and more years ago. The first statement is, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure, to those who are single-minded, to those who are focused in heart. This introductory statement is a bell ringer. It is a bold declaration of uncontrovertible, undeniable truth. Surely, indeed, God is one who is good to his own people, to those whom he has bound himself to, and to those who are resolute, to those who have set aside those other things which would come as an admixture, would come as a dilutive effect, a dilutive mixture, diluting the purity of the heart. God indeed is good. It is the very fabric of who he is. That God is good to Israel and to those who are pure in heart. We will come back to this at the conclusion but then we immediately set in verse 2 into a very honest examination of the heart. Here is what it says. And what is taking place is that the worshiper says, I was distracted. There were other things that caught my attention and I came so very close to the edge and I came so close to danger, eternal, hideous danger. Let's hear what the words of Asaph are. As for me, if this is a very personal psalm. There is a very personal declaration that follows after that introductory grand and solid statement of God's goodness, we come to the very personal level, as for me, my own feet came dangerously close to stumbling, my steps they almost slipped. The picture that is drawn for us is someone that is going along a mountain path, and that path is so desperately narrow on the one side, there is a sheer face that rises up, and there is really nothing to grasp onto. And on the other side, there is a sheer drop-off, and precariously, the person is making their way forward along this path, trying to hug against the rock face, knowing that one false move, one false step, would mean surely the end. As for me, he was making his way along in this world. My feet came close to a stumble, and I almost slipped. And this was the reason why I was envious of the arrogant I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It seemed that everything constantly went well for them. What a horrific danger there is in perception. What a danger there is when we take our eyes off of the goodness of God and we start to look around 
and we make comparisons ourselves with others, and the face which they put on, and the appearance of all of the goods that they have, and we begin to wonder, is it really worth it to serve the Lord? Is there truly a reward for those who keep themselves to God? The psalm writer says, I was envious. I saw what was right before me. There are no pains in their death. Their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men. They are not plagued like mankind. Their pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. I'm not sure that that's very attractive, but here the psalmist is endeavoring to demonstrate that these are well-fed people. They seem to be well taken care of. They seem to prosper in every way that their hand turns. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They are criminals. They do not abide by anyone's law. They speak of oppression. They speak from on high. It's not that they are reaching up. It's that they're looking down on everyone else. They have set their mouth against the heavens. And their tongue parades through the earth. There's a real picture as well. They set their mouth against the heavens. God actually laughs at them, and you can refer to Psalm 1 and 2 for that, how that the Lord laughs at those who set their heart and their mouth against him. But their tongue parades through the earth. That is, they are braggarts. They boast about what they have done and what they have accomplished and what they have, so they imagine. Verse 10 continues on. Therefore his people return to this place. Waters of abundance are drunk by them. Doesn't seem like they're ever in need. They're ever thirsty. They say, how does God know? And is their knowledge with the Most High? They are deriding God. They say, we don't need God. We can take care of ourselves. We are able. We are strong. We are mighty. Is there knowledge with the Most High? There is certainly knowledge with us. Is there any knowledge in the heavens that can supersede? Oh, how arrogant, how boastful these ones are. And the psalmist said, Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they have increased in wealth. That's the appearance, that's the perception. And the conclusion is, Surely in vain. Surely for no good purpose have I kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. I, unlike these ones that I've just described to you, I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. There is such a radical difference. These ones who care nothing for God, they enjoy it all and they are at peace. They are doing well. But as I've sought to live a life that would honor God, it seems that as a result, all that I've received are blows. I've been struck. I've been chastened every morning. We're getting close to something that each of us need to remember in exactly those times when it seems the wicked prosper Verse 15, 
If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. The psalmist is saying, if that had truly gotten a hold of me as it wanted to get a hold of me, I would have been a betrayer. I would have denied. I would have been turning my back on all that is right and true. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Indeed, it is. Troublesome to see that the wicked do prosper, at least for a time, that they advance in the pursuits that they have, God being patient with them, even as he was patient with Adam and Eve. He could have struck them in the instant that they sinned. But God was patient with them as he continues patient with us. And the psalmist said, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. He is troubled at how that he had come to the very edge and how that he was about to slip down that precipice of envy and bitterness. And verse 17 said, until there was a key point, a key point in time and a key point in geography that made a difference. He says, until I came into the sanctuary of God. And what he is saying is that I have come into the presence of God. Now, that might be in your private closet where you meet with God. And it might be in that time of day when you shut out all of the other distractions of the day and of the world and you say, Lord, this time is yours and yours alone. And this spot I have reserved and I have dedicated to you and to you alone. It doesn't necessarily have to be a sanctuary such as where I am standing right now and preaching to you through this means. But it is that place and time where you shut yourself in with God and the Lord in a very special and a particular way, he stirs truth within your heart and it comes just like a lightning bolt and just like a hammer down on your head and your eyes are opened to see things that you hadn't seen before. The psalmist says, this was what was going on in my heart and I was all churned up about it until I came into the presence of God, and then all of the facade, all of those things which seemed so real and which were reaching out and wanting to grab a hold of me and entangle me and divert me from God's truth, all of a sudden there was a balance, there was an open-eyed open reality there was a vision of what was truly real. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived, I saw through the sham. Then I perceived their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. I'd like you to consider for a moment the patience of God. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, 5, and 6, the Apostle Paul, as he's opening up the great book of Romans, he speaks of the patience of God and how that it would draw us. God's intent is that his patience would be that open door through which men and women would come and that they would realize the goodness of God 
in not striking them down in an instant, but that his desire is that we would come to the very point of repentance. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. God's kindness, God's mercy, his desire, his intent is that it would lead us to repentance. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, we again read about the days of Noah, people who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. And Peter, as he took pen again in hand for 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 and verse 15, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And verse 15, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The patience of the Lord, so many, they regard it as well, God doesn't care. God doesn't see. Is there a God at all? Yes, indeed, there is. And his patience, his forbearance, is that we would come and that we would turn, that we would repent and that we would truly live and that we would be trophies of his grace, of his mercy, and of his great glory. Verse 21 of Psalm 73 says, When my heart was embittered, what bitterness does to the heart? It's, it's a deadly poison. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless, I was ignorant how that strikes close to home. I was like a beast before you. But the psalmist says, enough about me, enough about my erring ways, enough of how that my feet are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. He says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me, and afterward, you will receive me to glory. And this really brings us right back to that opening statement of the first verse. Surely, God is good to Israel to those who are pure in heart. What could be better that God, than God continually being with us, that he takes us by the hand, that he guides us with his counsel, and that he receives us into his very presence in glory. The psalmist, he comes to the conclusion, in verse 25 says, a question, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. Here is the psalmist saying, Lord, I am going to have a single focus. I am going to narrow down that broad vision that I had. It encompassed all of these distractions and different things. And I saw, oh, look at there over there. And look at this one over here. And 
Why are they prospering when they do not worship, when they do not honor God? And the psalmist is saying, I am going to have a pure heart, and a pure heart has a single vision. And the psalmist says, whom have I in heaven beside you? I desire nothing on earth outside of you. He says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but Lord, you don't fail. He says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God, the one who faileth not, he is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Just earlier today, I was changing some batteries. Batteries fail, but our God He's better than any advertiser's battery that they say goes on and on and on. Our God, his strength faileth never. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. And he comes back once again in the concluding verse to speak personally in the New American Standard Bible, which I'm reading from, it repeats what we start off with in verse two. Others, other translations phrase it differently, but he says again in verse 28, as for me, there is that personal aspect. There is, this isn't just somebody somewhere else. This is personal. And he says, as for me, the nearness of my God, of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. What is your refuge? Have you made the Lord your refuge? And is the nearness of God what you desire? Or would you say to the Lord, Lord, please, not too close. Ah, there are some things in my life that I would not want you to see. Get rid of that junk. Get rid of that trash, that garbage, that rot. And let him come to cleanse and to dwell within, to tabernacle in your heart that he might be all in all. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your word. So continue to be strengthening and blessing and helping us, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.